Hello students, this is Professor Gore, and um, in this recorded lecture, I'm going to be talking about a topic that usually students find pretty fascinating. Um, it was definitely a turning point in American political history, and that is the Watergate scandal. Um, and really, the, the effects of this is seen all the way to present day. Uh, after really the Vietnam War and Watergate, uh, Americans no longer kind of trusted overall anything that was coming out of the government. You, if, you, if you polled Americans, and surveyed them before the Vietnam War and Watergate. Um, and you asked them, do you think that the president and Congress is doing what's right and best for the country? You'd have a well majority that would say yes. If you polled the country today, um, you would see far less than 50% of the population that would say that. And you see uh, Americans more distrustful of politicians and so forth. And so um, it is a fascinating yet tragic event in American history. Um, because a, a president is forced to resign for uh, a scandal. Um, and actually, had President Nixon not resigned, Nixon would have uh, been impeached and been the only president impeached and removed from office. We've had two presidents impeached in American history, Andrew Johnson, um, right after the American Civil War, but he survived by one vote. So he was impeached by the House of Representatives and went to the Senate, but you had to have two-thirds of the Senate to uh, remove somebody from office. And then President Clinton in the 1990s because of the Monica Lewinsky scandal was impeached, but did not have the two thirds majority vote required in the Senate to remove him from office. So let's look at where uh, it begins. Now, I love this picture I found on, on Google Images years ago. Um, if any of those who've seen the movie Scarface, it's meant to be humorous. Um, but Nixon did get the nickname Tricky Dick Nixon uh, from a journalist actually who interviewed him um, out when he was the governor of California in the 60s. But Nixon uh, faced off against George McGovern in 1972. Uh, George McGovern had been a presidential candidate, 1968 Democratic nomination, but lost to Hubert Humphrey. Uh, he was from South Dakota, um, and uh, McGovern, McGovern ran on the, the, the promise that he was going to pull troops out within 90 days, which Nixon does in January 1973 anyway. Uh, but he appealed to racial minorities, feminists, leftists, and the youth. Um, but appealing to these groups, McGovern kind of alienated the majority of Americans, particularly the working class voters. Uh, he appealed most strongly to the anti-war movement. Um, his vice presidential candidate, uh, candidate Thomas Eggleston was pulled out for health reasons um, because of um, different uh, personal problems and so forth. Uh, Nixon's going to win a landslide victory. So, all right. So, how does the election of 1972 lead to the Watergate scandal, and what what why is it called the Watergate scandal? Well, before the the 1972 election in, in June 17, uh, uh, basically um, five men had broken into the Watergate uh, complex. Now, what this was, it was a building that had. Um, um, kind of like a hotel and, and uh, apartment area, um, but it was where the Democratic National Party headquarters were, and that's where they kept a lot of files and so forth. Um, and there was a group um, that was formed before the election called CREEP. Yes, I, I can't make that up. That was actually what the acronym stood for. It's Committee for the Re-Election of the President, okay? And um, anyway, it, it what, what happened is five members of CREEP broke in the Democratic uh, National Committee's headquarters to try to spy and figure out what their strategy was for the 1972 election. Now, what had ended up happening is they had stuck something in one of the, the doors to uh, so they could get out um, after they had gotten some files and so forth. One of the janitors actually saw the door propped open and alerted police, and these men were apprehended. Two of the men arrested were G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt, who were both former FBI and CIA agents uh, working for Crete. And so you had two highly skilled and trained individuals in espionage and so forth who were involved in this. Okay. And so these guys were also part of Nixon's group that he called the plumbers, um, or at least what other people called them, uh, because their job was to plug administration leaks and do other uh, kind of nasty political jobs. So, for instance, uh, we're going to get to the Pentagon Papers here in just a minute, uh, that was uh, leaked by Daniel Ellsberg, and the plumbers are going to try to break into his psychiatric office uh, to try to dig up some dirt on him to kind of blackmail him or get him to shut up or discredit him and so forth. 
uh, because the Pentagon Papers look really bad in American history uh, and so forth. So let's look at uh, the Watergate um, scandal. And um, Nixon really was his own downfall. Um, you know, he was a brilliant man, um, had, you know, would have gone down as a pretty successful foreign policy with detente um, and working out the SALT Treaty with the Soviet Union and establishing trade that's going to be good long term for the United States with China. Uh, but he was paranoid about um, his political enemies and so forth. And I mentioned this in a previous lecture that uh, later it came out that uh, he had a list of all, made a list of all his political enemies and Gerald Ford, who replaces him as president. And Gerald Ford was well liked and respected by both Republicans and Democrats. He was kind of just kind of upstanding moral guy uh, in Congress that was well thought of just because he's a good dude and, and uh, a good congressman. Uh, but Gerald Ford was quoted as saying, wow, a, a man who makes a list of, of all his enemies, he's got too many enemies. But Gerald Ford really didn't have any um, that were uh, of any, any, any kind of political enemies. And so um, one of the things that, that Nixon did as well is he kind of closed himself off from most of his cabinet and he only listened to kind of his kind of his White House staff and Henry Kissinger. And uh, one of the things that um, uh, Nixon had done as well, and uh, um, LB, there's a lot of recording of LBJ doing this, uh, because it's pretty common now for a, a president um, to write a presidential memoir after they leave the White House. So uh, like George W. Bush has written um, Decision Points, uh, which I've read uh, this, 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 this year. And I'm sure President Obama is going to come out with a presidential memoir uh, that I may read down the road as well. And so um, there was a recording device under the Oval Office desk so that he could record a lot of conversations. So, you know, years later when Nixon is retired, he could um, go back and listen to these tapes and help him write his presidential memoirs. Um, so that those tapes are end up going to be his downfall because um, that would either show his guilt or show his innocence uh, in this particular uh, instance. So when Daniel Ellsberg in 1971, um, who had worked for um, the Defense Department, leaked to um, the New York Times and it broke out into other newspapers as well. Um, basically, it was a, a huge stu Pentagon study of the Vietnam War. And what had happened was uh, it showed that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was provoked. Okay, and, and uh, it came out in the, in the press in 1964 that it was that the that the North Vietnamese just attacked the United States vessels, and that what led to a greater involvement in the Vietnam War, which was very controversial at this time. And it showed that uh, both the Kennedy and Johnson administration knew that we couldn't win the war, and so Nixon was outraged at this confidential. Um, uh, classified information was leaked. Okay. And uh, also he was in the midst of, of, of detente talks with the Soviet Union and China at the same time. So the timing is terrible. And so Nixon hired, um, there is G Gordon Liddy at the bottom center and then Howard Hunt to basically uh, try to break into his psychiatrist uh, office and dig up any dirt on him in his files. Uh, but they're not able to uh, dig up anything to discredit him. Um, so, one of the things, too, is that uh, Nixon's attorney general, John Mitchell, um, had resigned after his serving in the first term to serve as the, the head of the, uh, the of CREEP, Committee for the Re-election of the President. And um, um, one of the things, too, that the committee did, which would be frowned upon, obviously, today, launched a special fundraising campaign to raise as much money as possible for a new law made it necessary to report such contributions. That's kind of a dirty political move that would be outlawed today. Because uh, you have to uh, claim and uh, all of your political contributions. That's why when you see a, uh, somebody running for office and they're they know they're going to lose, you'll see you'll hear that they're suspending their campaign. What that means is is they're they're no longer really running, but because they have campaign donations, they have to spend those up uh, legally. They can't just pocket that. Okay. Uh, so anyway, that happens, and then um, so one of the things is. Um, Nixon worried that Edmund Muskie uh, would win the Democratic nomination uh, against George McGovern and uh, he would be a formidable foe. So what it did is um, probably the plumbers found a letter that ends up getting leaked to the press that uh, Muskie had made some kind of insulting remarks to French Canadians and so forth. 
It also claimed that uh, Muskie's wife was an alcoholic. Um, and so it happened right before the New Hampshire primary, which is the second state that decides uh, uh, for the uh, in the primaries. You have I will be in first in the New Hampshire, which, by the way, was a funny quote from the New Hampshire governor a few years ago where he says, in Iowa, they pick corn. In New Hampshire, we pick presidents. So uh, that's a little New Hampshire state pride for him. Anyway, so Muskie ends up going down and McGovern wins the nomination. Now, here's what the Watergate Hotel looks like uh, at that time. And uh, I'm sorry, it was an apartment complex, not a hotel. And what ends up happening is the Watergate break in in June 17, 1972. It was actually the second attempt. The first one failed. And these guys get caught. Okay. Now, um, basically, Nixon and his aides uh, try to cover up uh, all of this. So Halderman, Elric, uh, Mitchell, um, you also had a guy named Chuck Colson, uh, who's kind of a, a fascinating story with the whole Watergate scandal. Uh, Chuck Colson uh, actually um, goes to prison for the for some of the Watergate stuff, uh, radically changes his life, gets out and finds one of the biggest uh, prison ministries in the country. And, and uh, is kind of seen as a guy who really reformed his life. Uh, he passed away, I think, in 2011. Um, but he was somebody who kind of redeemed himself on the Watergate scandal. But uh, it took a while for that to happen. So. Um, Nixon wins the 1972 election, and but the story just will not go away. And Nixon claims, look, look, these, these guys acted on their own. I don't know anything about this. Okay, keep denying that. Well, then there was a Watergate trial that began um, at the, the month of his second inauguration. And the defendants pled guilty, uh, or, or the ones that pled innocent were found guilty. Now, um, Nixon did approve the, the payment of hush money to E. Howard Hunt um, to basically like, hey, if we pay you enough, you go to prison for a little bit and then you'll get out and you'll have all this money, but don't don't say that we were involved in all this. Well, the judge was very suspicious of all of this and uh, felt like that E. Howard Hunt and G. Gordon Liddy and so forth knew more than what they were saying. So he gave them the max sentence that they could possibly be given, which was 40 years. That was a minor break in. Uh, but again, 40 years to try to get them to give information about more about what was going on. OK, now there's two young reporters uh, who are kind of considered uh, legend, legendary uh, journalist, uh, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein. In fact, I've seen these guys interviewed uh, just in the last year on national television. They're very well respected. They were uh, writers, uh, young writers for The Washington Post. And so these two guys just would not let it go. They knew that there was more. Now, part of the reason why they knew there was more is they were getting uh, secret information from an FBI informant. Okay, now that uh, that FBI informant's uh, code name was Deep Throat. Okay, that was actually the name for it. If you read any books or, or seen any movies about uh, Watergate and so forth, then you'll see this. Uh, but they would meet with him in um, uh, a parking garage, and he would kind of leak information to them slowly and try to hope that they could dig a little deeper to find out what was going on. Okay, and so. Um, Basically, as uh, the, the Washington Post wouldn't let this go and rumors of White House involvement keep spreading. Uh, Nixon, to try to save himself, forced uh, his two closest aides, Halderman on the top left and Elrickman, um, to resign. OK, now Nixon here on national television, the American public claims I'm going to take responsibility for any kind of thing that may have happened in my administration, yada, yada, yada. But Nixon is saving himself. OK, now um, here's where things changed. Uh, John Dean, the, the president's personal legal counselor, um, basically did, he didn't want to go to prison for um, something that he wasn't involved in. He, and he testified um, that uh, Nixon ordered the cover-up and knew about the cover-up and so forth. And so he agreed to testify. Well, this made Nixon livid and so forth. Um, also, um, another former presidential assistant to save himself, Alexander Butterfield, revealed that Nixon had the taping system under the Oval Office. So remember, the taping system was originally installed for uh, Nixon to be able to write his presidential memoirs after um, the, um, his presidency, which is you know, pretty cool that a, a president decides to do that. So that way they can um, uh, write a, a more accurate presidential memoir um, that can sell and help support them financially after their presidency. And so um, what ends up happening is they're like, well, you know, Mr. President, if this tape taping system is, in fact, uh, there, can you release it so it'll show that you didn't know anything about it? OK, well, Nixon didn't want to give it up because he said that was private information. Now, what ends up happening in October of 1973 is what's called the Saturday Night Massacre. 
Um, and what it is is basically Nixon um, um, allowed um, a special prosecutor from the Justice Department, um, who happens to be a Harvard law professor, Archibald Cox, um, to investigate. Well, Nixon ordered Cox fired for demanding the tapes because he doesn't want to give over the tapes. And that's where uh, he also fired some other uh, White House staff, which, which uh, showed, kind of made it look uh, that he was covering things up further. And the press called it the Saturday Night Massacre. Okay? Now, in the midst of this, Spiro Agnew, which really had, had nothing to do with the Watergate scandal, um, this kind of tough talking governor from Maryland, um, he was uh, accused of tax evasion and also taking bribes when he was governor of Maryland. Uh, and so right before the Saturday Night Massacre, Spiro Agnew has to resign. It's had nothing to do with Watergate, but you're talking about Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. This is like absolutely horrible timing for Nixon. Um, and so Nixon appointed Gerald Ford, um, who was the Republican House Minority Leader, um, to serve as VP. Okay. Um, so it was kind of interesting that uh, uh, Ford comes in. Now, later when Ford pardons Nixon, it's going to be claimed that they made a secret deal. That's not the case. Uh, Gerald Ford never made a secret deal with, with Nixon. I'm not pardoning him or anything. Um, so what ends up happening in July of 1974, uh, the House Judiciary Committee holds uh, a hearing to see if they have enough evidence to impeach Nixon. Okay. Um, and so one of the things that uh, they decide is that they're going to vote to impeach Nixon for obstruction of justice and abuse of power if he doesn't give over the tapes. Okay. So Nixon finally, um, after the Supreme Court ordered that he had to give up the tapes, gave up the tapes, okay, only when forced to, but when they um, were given over, there is 18 minutes of silence. Now, he claimed that uh, one of the, his secretaries and so forth had accidentally deleted that and it was a mistake, yada, yada. But it clearly shows that he was guilty. OK, and so um, he knows that he is done for and that he's going to be impeached. And so he writes this resignation letter. I've never seen a shorter uh, uh, and sweeter resignation letter ever. It says, Dear Mr. Secretary, I hereby resign the office of the President of the United States, Richard Nixon. And he gives that to Henry Kissinger, in which Kissinger assigns it and okays it. And so here is the aftermath of that. Now, you may be asking, why does Nixon um, resign and not try to go through the impeachment proceedings and save himself? Well, for one thing is he saw the writing on the wall and he was going to lose. But secondly, if you're impeached and removed from office, you don't get to keep your uh, retirement benefits uh, because the president is given a pension. Uh, like a lot of federal government employees are given a pension, which is actually kind of one of the cool things working for the federal government. You may not get paid as much, but your benefits are nice and you get a nice pension. So my parents were both state employees and they're retired now and they're living off the Arkansas state pension. So as a result of uh, Watergate, Congress passes several things. OK, one of them is the 26th Amendment. OK, and I, I think this is a uh, great. This is the last group in American history that we've had up to this point that have been given the right to vote. And that is it lowers the voting age from 21 to 18. So 18, 19, 20 year olds, the last group in American history given the right to vote. Because you remember it was first given to, to non-property owning uh, uh, um, ad white adult men. Then it was given to African-American adult men with, with the 15th Amendment. And then you see women given the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. And then in 1924, you see Native Americans given the right to vote. Um, and then you see in the 1970s, the 26th Amendment give the 18, 19th and, and, or 18, 19, 20 year olds the right to vote. So the reason why it was done is because of Vietnam. It's not uh, Americans didn't think it was right that 18, 19, 20 year olds get sent to uh, Vietnam and die for our country, and they have no uh, say so politically who who determines that. Uh, also, the War Powers Resolution gets passed by Congress, even though Nixon vetoed it, and they override his veto um, because it basically says that a president cannot send in troops, large bodies of troops, overseas for more than sixty days. So this is trying to prevent a Gulf of Tonkin resolution happening, uh, and the President be able to send troops to get us involved in a foreign war. And so. Um, so let's give an example. Let's say President Trump wanted to send troops to Iran or somewhere. Um, if he was going to, um, he would have to uh, have congressional approval. Now, you can send in special forces operations like President Obama sent in in 2011, uh, SEAL Team 6, to, to do the raid to kill bin Laden. And uh, that doesn't have, to have congressional approval because that's a small force and it's less than 60 days. I mean, heck, they were only there for a couple hours and they were like, see ya. Okay. Also, in 1974, um, Congress passed the Freedom of Information Act, um, 
that uh, gain, that allowed citizens to get information from the federal government that is not highly classified. Uh, also, you have the Fair Campaign Practices Act of 1974. This was to, to prevent stuff that Creep was doing. And um, so basically any kind of campaign donations you get, you have to claim that and show it and so forth. And then lastly, the Independent, Independent Counsel Act of 1978 required the attorney general uh, in cases of suspected criminal activity uh, to basically rec rec recluse himself and uh, allow a different prosecutor. If he, if he might be, he or she might be involved and they can recluse themselves and allow um, a special prosecutor and independent counsel to come in. Uh, so Jeff Sessions actually did this. Well, all right, we're going to get to Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter's presidency um, in the next part.